Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this View on Africa briefing with the theme SADC seeks a parliament. So why are we focusing on the efforts for the SADC parliamentary forum to be transformed into a fully fledged parliament? Basically, the 38th uh, SADC summit that just ended in Vintuk, Namibia on the 18th of August discuss many issues and in question time I can address uh, some of the peace and security issues that were um, on the forefront there surrounding, um, for example, the DRC, Lesotho and so on. But it became clear that one of the main challenges of SADC going forward, uh, also being led by Namibia now for the next year, will be the efforts to make sure SADC gets closer to people SADC must show the citizens of the 16 member states that it uh, listens, that it is uh, a regional organization that speaks to them and that um, has their interests um, at heart. So um, basically I'm going to very quickly look at what happened at the summit and what was said around the whole issue of a SADC parliament. Then I'm going to look at some of the background of what the SADC Parliamentary Forum actually does at the moment. And some of the other parliaments, we have the East African Legislative Assembly in East Africa. We have ECOWAS, the ECOWAS Parliament and then the Pan-African Parliament, which is probably the most well-known of all of those. And then finally, I'll ask the question, uh, where are we in terms of getting the SADC Parliament and what are the various issues um, that might be obstacles in attaining the goal of a, a fully-fledged SADC parliament. So at the uh, 38th summit in Vintuk, in various of the statements and declarations, there was this commitment from summit, from uh, leaders, to support the move towards greater democracy, deepening democracy in the region. And then, um, as I said, I can quote from Haga Geingop, the new chairperson of uh, SADC, where he said, I am confident that we will continue to make significant progress in the area of governance, especially given the outstanding work of the SADC Parliamentary Forum in entrenching democracy in the region. During its chairmanship, Namibia promises to intensify discussions on the establishment of the SADC parliament. Now, there were representatives there of the SADC parliamentary forum. Uh, this was welcomed, but there is definitely still a long way to go uh, in terms of, of attaining this goal. But as I say, it is a commitment now of the leaders. It was not uh, in the final communique of the SADC summit. There wasn't mention of that. And in actual fact, if we now look more closely to the SADC parliamentary forum, it's not in the SADC um, treaty as such that was signed in 1992 in Vintuk that's, that founded uh, SADC. Other than, for example, um, the, e, the East African Legislative Assembly, which is an integral part of the EAC. So uh, already that is, seems to be something of a drawback. So this, the SADC Parliamentary Forum is very active. It's been uh, there since 1997. It, it meets twice a year. It is essentially an interparliamentary organization as you get other interparliamentary organizations around the world. But it has been a forum for advice and discussion. Um, basically, each of the um, parliaments in the SADC region uh, is allowed to have five representatives at the parliamentary forum. They do discuss issues like model laws, which would then advise parliaments in the region how to uh, deal with issues such as um, child marriage, uh, electoral laws, electoral management bodies, etc. This is one of the issues actually where uh, the SADC Parliamentary Forum has actually uh, come out quite strongly when it comes to observing elections and um, noting discrepancies between SADC's own uh, protocols on elections and then uh, what happens on the ground. So the SADC Parliamentary Forum is there, but there is definitely a willingness, and it is in all the documentation and the interviews we've seen with the SADC uh, Parliamentary Forum, there is uh, a move towards a fully-fledged 
uh, parliament, there is at least from the side of the parliamentary forum a willingness uh, and an urgency almost to get to a fully fledged parliament. Now, if we look, for example, at the East African Legislative Assembly, which is, is the strongest and most functioning of these regional parliaments. It's been uh, there since 2001. Each uh, of the six countries of the, uh, yes, six countries of the EAC then have nine representatives. Uh, this is where maybe one of the weaknesses of the EALA is that countries um, have equal representation and it's not based on the size of the economy or the number of uh, inhabitants. For West Africa, the East, the ECOWAS parliament, for example, uh, has got five, me five members also from each parliament, but then over and above that, depending on the size of the country, there are quotas. For example, Nigeria would have 35 members um, and only and the others might only have five. So in East Africa, nine representatives, originally only Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania, when it worked really very well. Burundi and Rwanda came, uh, joined the EIC around 10 years ago and then in 2016, South Sudan as well. So there are many problems with this uh, legislative assembly, but um, what does it do? Um, basically, it legislates on regional integration issues. So it is the body that implements these um, uh, regional integration uh, decisions by the summit of the EAC, so issues around customs, trade, etc. The the laws that are passed are by the EALA are supranational. So a law um, uh, carries more weight than a, a national law, and that's the only parliament, from what I can understand, where this is the case. In all the others, uh, the the um, national sovereignty still carries the day. So the EA, I'll, I have many problems as well. I mean, it's being accused of only being a place where MPs go who can't make it elsewhere, etc. But um, it does have a strong oversight role on the EAC activities and then notably the budget. Uh, it has to um, oversee and discuss the budget of the EIC, which is, is a strong contribution that it makes. So that, I think, is probably the, the gold standard when it comes to African regional parliaments. There is, as I said, the ECOWAS parliament as well that has 115 members. It is, it is a lot like the um, SADC parliamentary forum. It's an advisory body. Um, and there are also lots of discussions how to strengthen the ECOWAS parliament. And then the P, uh, finally, the Pan-African Parliament, which um, has been uh, in the firing line these last few months because of allegations of corruption and misspending. There's a lot of cynicism around the PAP. Uh, it has 225 members and it was... Um, it was created in 2004, just after the creation of the African Union, and it sits here in Midrand in uh, South Africa, of course. Why does the Pan-African Parliament struggle so much? I think it's pretty evident when one looks at the um, representatives at the Pan-African Parliament. Here you are dealing with um, 54 member states, uh, 55 member states of the African Union now, many of those parliaments are not democratically elected. And so very often the representatives at the Pan-African Parliament reflect the weak democracy on the continent. And that's where some argue SADC will have an advantage because SADC, of SADC's 16 states, we do have functioning democratically elected parliaments that are representative of the people um, to a larger extent maybe than if you put all the members of the Pan-African Parliament together. But definitely the problems within the PIP is going to make it more difficult for SADC to move towards a parliament because already... Um, there is not such a strong appetite um, by any of the heads of state, even in SADC, to have an, a, SADC a SADC parliament. Um, so the fact that the 
PIP that have actually had its budget suspended by the African Union at the last summit in uh, Mauritania because of uh, allegations of mismanagement. The fact that the PIP doesn't function so well is definitely going to be a drawback for, for this move. Another thing that is extremely important, and I think um, probably in the SADC region, uh, people are not uh, as aware or it is not on the forefront, is the whole issue of the SADC tribunal. Now, we have an East African Court of Justice. We have an ECOWAS Court of Justice. From what I can see, that functions, at least functions, fairly well in some cases. The East African Court of Justice can then be the judicial arm of the EA. LA, and if there are transgressions, that is the court that ind even individuals and member states and corporations can go um, to this higher court. And, and so you see maybe, you know, from of the last cases, a company in Burundi that went to the uh, East African Court of Justice to say that the Burundian government seized my goods when I was trying to ship it over to Rwanda, etc. I mean, uh, um, so issues like that do get to be listened to at the Court of Justice. The same with the ECOWAS Court of Justice. People might remember the very recent case of Khalifa Sal, the mayor of uh, Dakar, who uh, is uh, imprisoned and he took his case to the ECOWAS Court of Justice and the, just and the court ruled that um, he didn't get a fair trial initially. The court um, penalized uh, Seneg uh, Senegal for the way he was treated, but in the long run, well, his appeal, he's not out of prison yet, his appeal continued. So um, the drama around SADC is that um, the SADC tribunal was suspended in 2010. I think it's a, it is fairly well known, the fact that commercial farmers in Zimbabwe took the Zimbabwean government to the tribunal, which is based in Ventuk, and um, the Zimbabwean government, led by Robert Mugabe, um, basically pressurized the rest of SADC and President Jacob Zuma at the time for this tribunal to be suspended. Now, this is an ongoing issue. The um, SADC heads of state had then decided that the SADC tribunal will be um, reinstated with a new sort of a protocol where it will be a court where only states uh, can make cases against one another. So it totally removes that whole recourse by individuals or companies or so on to a higher regional court. The, um, so the case is ongoing. In fact, here in South Africa, there are um, uh, strong moves to say actually uh, the government was wrong and it didn't have a mandate to suspend or to support the suspension of this tribunal. And we'll, um, we're following closely at what is going to happen there. So in a nutshell, there are these uh, regional um, parliaments and courts of justice that function pretty well. And it, the question can be asked, why SADC, which has a strong democratization uh, um, ethic and has, a, has a, a reputation of having several member states that have been on the forefront of uh, free and fair elections, democratic transitions. Why would SADC be the region in Africa with no um, strong SADC parliament and no uh, functioning tribunal either? What, uh, but then on the other hand, of course, many people say there is no point in just creating institutions that are going to be very costly for just another talk shop. And that is really not um, going to add any value for ordinary citizens uh, in the region. So why would a parliament be necessary? Well, um, first of all, to implement the decisions of the SADC summits on regional integration, and there are many, and SADC does a lot of work in terms of industrialization, infrastructure, all um, uh, has made great strides when it comes to um, economic regional integration. So the parliament would be necessary to implement and to to give uh, credibility in a way also to the, the decisions made by the SADC summit and then to deepen democracy in the region. 
Why would now be a good time for um, such a move? Well, Namibia is now um, chairing uh, SADC, and as I as I said, the president Hage Geingop was quite uh, strong in his statements uh, in his opening address about supporting such a move, and. Um, there is a sense that with four new presidents in the SADC region as well, that um, these new governments, I mean, it, this was the first SADC summit without any of the founding fathers of SADC present. Sam Najoma was actually in, in the hall when the opening, but, um, uh, you know, the other um, leaders, Robert Mugabe, for the first time was not present at a SADC summit. So there is almost a window of opportunity to say, um, uh, deepen democracy, we won't have these dark shadows of the past hanging over our heads, and to show citizens of, of uh, the region that SADC really um, can be uh, uh, an organization that means something and that we citizens can also have a voice. So those two issues, the the fact that Namibia is is chairing and in, is behind it, and, and by the way, um, SAD, uh, the SADC Parliamentary Forum is based in Ventuk. Um, so Ventuk could be seen, uh, if it wants to be a champion of this move, and then this new wave of democratization uh, in the region. The negatives, of course, is, uh, as I said, the cost. These um, parliaments uh, sometimes are very costly. The budget of the PIP uh, itself, I mean, South Africa pays for the buildings, etc. It is it's something like $18, $18 million, um, just the annual budget of the PIP uh, functioning. Every member state pays for its delegation to the PIP. So it can be quite costly. Um, as I said earlier, Secondly, there's very little buy-in from the leaders. That seems clear. Even though we had statements from Ramaphosa, from Kaingop, um, there is, uh, when you speak to delegates and, and government representatives, there really isn't that strong buy-in. And then the question is, can the parliament function strongly without a, a tribunal, without um, all the other institutions also functioning well? I mean... Um, the tribunal, uh, by the way, is in the SADC treaty, and it is created by the treaty, um, and and it is an independent body that does not report to the summit, whereas the SADC parliamentary forum, as I said, is not in, in the initial SADC treaty. So um, those are some of the questions, and, and also if we look at the other sort of civil society initiatives around SADC and how they've been struggling, it also begs the question, how are we going to get the SADC parliament functioning and being, uh, um, getting up to being a truly legislative body? The, um, uh, the struggle around the SADC Business Council is a case in point, where in, in actual fact, South Africa's chair personship of uh, SADC from 2017 to 2018 had as a theme working with the private sector and it was one of the aims of South Africa to institutionalize the um, relations between SADC and the private sector and it has been a long uphill battle. There was a business forum, uh, several discussions, several false starts. Now there is a uh, a new plan on the table for a SADC Business Council. At the moment, NEP, the NEPAD Business um, Council is helping uh, as an interim secretariat for this Business Council. So it just shows that um, getting these regional uh, um, institutions off the ground is really um, extremely difficult. And if they aren't member states and leaders that push for this very strongly, um, then it is very difficult um, to get it off the ground. As an illustration, for example, the Pan-African Parliament, the Malabo Protocol of 2014, which was supposed to give the PAP legislative powers, which it doesn't have, um, needs 
28 ratifications in order to enter into force. At the moment, we've only got 11 ratifications. So there is not an appetite from heads of state to actually strengthen parliaments, regional parliaments, and yet uh, there is there are many statements that um, pledge a commitment towards strengthening um, parliamentary democracy.